Um, hello, welcome to Fair Use 101. Uh, thank you for coming to spend an hour out of your precious Dragon Con Friday to come and listen to a bunch of nerds talk about copyright. Uh, I figured we'd just start off with some brief introductions. Uh, I am Meredith Rose. Uh, I am a policy counsel at a group called Public Knowledge in Washington, D.C. We do uh, consumer advocacy work on tech policy issues. Uh, and part of my job description is copyright and fair use and fandoms and music licensing. And if you ever want to hear an hour of just an unhinged rant about how music licensing doesn't work, uh, feel free to hit me up after this panel. Um, and then we'll just go down and talk to some of the other panelists. Sure. I'm Courtney Lytle. I'm an attorney here in Georgia. I have a small consulting practice dealing mainly with startups and entrepreneurs. Um, occasional artists through the Georgia Lawyers for the Arts, which if you're local and you can't afford counsel, look for them. Georgia Lawyers for the Arts, pro bono group here locally. Um, I also teach at Emory Law School, and I do mostly intellectual property and small business law at this point. Hi, Dwayne Gatesell. I'm a lawyer from Austin, Texas. I have an intellectual property firm, so handle trademarks, copyrights, domain names, licensing, litigation, all that kind of stuff. Uh, my name is Donna Bartley. I'm an attorney in North Carolina. I handle primarily compliance, account, uh, compliance counseling for companies, uh, intellectual property, trademarks, copyrights, um, ethics issues. And since I'm bad in cleanup, I will give our panel disclaimer, which is we are attorneys, but we are not your attorney. So if you are looking for legal advice, you need to find your own attorney. Our comments there are for entertainment value only. And not even really that, frankly. <laughs> Come we back for the 10 p.m. panels when we're all drinking, then we're funny. <laughs> I think we're funny now, but I'm easily I'm amused. So on that note, um, so a couple of things just to get things out of the way. Um, kind of the way I was thinking we would structure this is we talk a little bit about the parameters, like what is copyright, and then talk about, and copyright 101 is its own panel. Uh, it's a very large Sunday. topic. So if you want to come for a more in-depth explanation of that, uh, come and see the panel on Sunday. Um, I think we'll just kind of go over the brief contours of what copyright is, then talk about what fair use is, and then you know we can talk a little bit freeform about what fair use means for things like fan fiction or cosplay, um, what uh, you know, how this impacts in the real world, the, what what the current fights are about this in policy land, which is where I'm from. Um, and leave, we want to leave plenty of time for audience questions because this is, this is a topic that people teach entire courses on at law school and you still don't quite hit everything. Um, so really, you know, what we want to do is be available to answer your questions and I guarantee you guys all more interesting questions than we will have, uh, you know, brain sparks to talk about otherwise. So Courtney, you want to kick us off? Sure. Since I get, since I get to wear my professor hat from time to time, I will do it now. And I'm not going to be able to do it back here. I'm sorry. Um, I can't talk. I can't talk without walking around. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Sorry, guys. I should have warned you. Courtney and I have been doing some variation of this panel for five years now, and this is the full pace. This is, is the uh, full pacing. It's back part of the forth. ritual. They always have me set up for my panels, but I didn't warn them ahead of time. I have to hold it. Oh, oh man, they're going to make on. me hold one arm. <laughs> you got the stand. They're fabulous. When I come in for the ones that I know I'm doing this in, they've got it ready for me because they know if I stand in one place and talk, I mumble. No. Also, and I we get, get you on boring. video that way. Uh -huh. That used to really twitch me out, but I'm used to it now, so we're good. Okay. Do I have y'all's approval? Can I do it from here? Okay. We're good. We are talking about fair use only in a copyright setting, so I've got to give you like the 30-second version of what we are and are not talking about. Trademark has a concept of fair use. It is not what we're talking about today. Trademark is your brand names. Someone in here, I'm sure, has a Coke or a Mountain Dew or something like that. A soda with any label? Someone has. There you go, Chick-fil-A, hold up the cup. See that red chicken? We know where they got that cup from across the room. I know where they ate lunch, and it's not because I know them. Hi, I'm Courtney. Um, I knew they ate at Chick-fil-A because there was that big red chicken. That's trademarks. That's not what we're talking about. Um, if anyone in here is like a really smart scientist and invents science things, that would be patents, and we're totally not talking about that. And there is no fair use in patents. Um, this is just <laughs> copyrights. Copyrights is books. It's art. Inexplicably, it's software. That's a different panel, too. It's the creative things. It's also, to an extent, costumes and characters and comic books and movies, which is where most of this comes in. So, copyright. 
If I hold a copyright, it means I have the right to keep people from copying my stuff. That's the short version. There are exceptions to this. There are things you're allowed to do in spite of the fact that I own the copyright to my notes right here. I own the copyright to these notes. You can't use them unless I let you, except in certain exceptions. Now, we tend to talk about fair use as one of those exceptions. It's not. One thing to keep in mind is that fair use is not like, you don't have a right to fair use the way you have a right to free speech. It's an affirmative defense to an action for infringement of copyright. So you don't really have a, a right to fair use until a judge says so. And we will talk in a lot of levels about different policy of when is a use fair and when can you take someone else's stuff and change it and do things with it, or as my clients tend to say, steal it. Um, I'm the one who represents bigger content holders. I'm the bad guy in the room. That's why I do this part of it, so I can get something out without people throwing stuff. Um, but so, as my clients would say, steal it, as most of um, the folks around me would say, creatively transform it into something else in a legal <laughs> way through the right of fair use. The problem, the hugest problem is from a practical level, you don't know until the judge tells you. And it's a very expensive process. The law of fair use, as we will talk about to some great degree, is really murky and unsettled. And it often comes down to who has the best litigator. Litigators don't work cheap. So, I mean, you've heard the old saw about how much justice can you afford. Sorry. There is something to that in fair use. Before you get your heart set on using something and transforming it creatively, think about what are you going to do if they tell you you have to stop. Because chances are if you're using something that lots of people like, that owner may already have lawyers. Do you already have lawyers? Sometimes that's the threshold question. That's the practical side of it. Let's talk a little bit about what the law does tell us. It should be a nice straightforward analysis. There's a law, there's a section, and it says specifically some specific kinds of use like criticism and um, parody and use in classes, classroom use, is protected as fair use. Yeah, um, and some professors have been found guilty of violating copyright law for using copyrighted material in their classrooms, notwithstanding an express part of the law saying you can do that. One of the cases honestly came down to whether the professor had made the copies, and this is at a time when we used to say make a Xerox, or if it had been done by the copy center. That should not make any legal difference. That was kind of how the case came down. The cases are wacky, and that's an old one. So even if there is an express allowance in the law, eh, maybe, maybe not. Then if you're not in one of the express categories, there are four, count them, four um, elements, none of which is determinative. Oh, look, that's so funny. She's organized. I love that. I put this together literally five minutes. <laughs> yeah, but you knew what, it, what we're going to have to talk about. And he had the slide. Oh, um. he, he, someone had to tell you these four factors. I win. I get to. Okay, first factor, purpose and character of the use, including whether it's a commercial use or for nonprofit educational purposes. If you're selling it, it cuts against you. But just because you're not doing it commercially does not mean you win. That's one of the misunderstandings. Oh, well, I'm not selling it. Yeah, okay, so part of one factor goes in your favor. Now, which factor is most important? Eh, no idea. They are all weighed in a squishy, unpredictable fashion. Our next one is the nature of the copyrighted work. Basically, is the copyrighted work one which is going to be more in the center of copyright, most creative? Or is it like a textbook or a history book or something that is protected by copyright, but only kind of. Um, among the things that are not protected by copyright are the facts in your book. So if, like me, you write really boring legal textbooks, the only thing that's protectable is the way you express the concepts, not the actual concepts or the facts. So nature of the copyrighted work, if it's a factual heavy book, it's not going to be as protected as if it's a novel. Okay. Third one, amount and substantiality of portion used. 
Did you use the whole thing? Or did you take a little bitty piece? Now, it doesn't always matter. You, if you take a little bitty piece and it's the only good part, you're still going down. Um, if you take the whole thing, you may not lose, but it's working against you at that point, right? How much of the work did you, I don't want to say steal, but that's what I'm thinking really loud, how, use, how much of the work did you use, okay? The example for um, substantiality is one of my favorite cases. Um, Gerald Ford, some of y'all are old enough to remember Watergate and all of that. Gerald Ford, who actually was a fabulous person, an interesting guy in his own right, um, wrote a really long memoir. And of course, the only part anyone at the time was interested in was the little bit on Watergate. Yeah, someone swiped an advanced copy and published that chapter. And it was just a little bit. It was like 20 pages out of bazillions of thousands of pages. But realistically, it was the only part anyone wanted to read. And so he won the case, even though they had just taken a little bitty bit. It was the heart of the work. So that's your um, substantiality of the portion used. And then the effect on the potential market. This kind of goes into both the um, character of the use and this one kind of fall into the concept that many of you have heard of, which is transformative work. Have you transformed the work into something else? You'll notice that's not actually in the statute anywhere, but it's a big litigator thing, and, it turn, and a lot of cases turn on it. It comes out in how you use it. Did you just copy it and resell it? Yeah, that's not going to work. Did you use it and turn it into something else? That's more likely to work. And the, the effect on the potential market. Are you selling this thing in the same place that the copyright holder would be selling stuff? or are you hitting a whole different market? Those are your four factors. Judges kind of weigh them in a nice squishy way and decide what this case is gonna come out as. There is a lovely article written by um, Judge Story, a famous judge, um, 25 years ago now I think the article was written about what a god awful mess fair use law is. I make my students read it because I like the article so they have to read it, that's how it works. You guys don't have to, it's fun. Um, he wrote very eloquently just how messed up the entire area of fair use was. He said, but don't worry. We've been mucking around for 10 years pretty badly with this, but any minute now, we're going to get it right. The law is going to solidify. It's going to be much more predictable. I tend to do transactional work. Transactional people really like predictability. I like to be able to know, can we do this, or are we going to end up going to court if we do this? My clients want to know that. We like to avoid fights. Litigators like to win them. We like to avoid them. And if you need a predictable law. You need to know whether something is okay or not. And Justice Story, or Judge Story was saying, I, really, we're getting better. Any minute now, it's gonna settle down, it's gonna be predictable, it's gonna be great. He wrote it 25 years ago, and I assure you, it has not gotten better. If anything, it has spiraled completely out of control. So I would have a better chance telling you who the next Democratic nominee is gonna be than telling you if something would be actual fair use. And I know a lot about it. Okay. That's your two minute or three minute, maybe a few minutes more than that, overview of what we're talking about. But now you've got the basic information so we can talk about the policy stuff. Thank you. Um, that's, yeah, wow. <laughs> Holy moly. Thank you. And they call it the aristocrats. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so talking a little bit about policy stuff. Um, a lot of, you know, fair use is one of those things where a lot of it takes place in the courts. You know, this is the actual, this is paraphrased slightly, but this is actually written in the statute in the U.S. Code, uh, 17 U.S.C. section 108, if anyone's like, or 107, sorry, 108 has to do with libraries. Um, if anyone's curious, you can just Google it. Um, and it really does boil down to, as Courtney said, kind of a judicial sniff test. Um, there's a couple of reasons why that is. Uh, one, it's sort of a, I'll know it when I see it, attitude towards fair use. Um, because you know, the, we have acknowledged for a long time that the um, ability of someone to use a work in a way that we think is socially beneficial in, in contravention of copyright exists on a sliding scale. Um, where you really start to run into problems, it, you know, it's sort of on one end you have a teacher um, photocopying a couple of pages of a book or photocopying an art print to show to their class. You know, that we generally consider to be very socially valuable. Parody, which is a very specific thing in copyright. Um, parody is, is not what you, so yes, Weird Al does not do parody. Weird Al is not parody under copyright law. He's satire. That's a different thing. Happy to rant about that. Um, Weird Al gets permission. Yes, Weird Al actually licenses his stuff, generally. Except for Gangster's Paradise, and that was like a whole That was a thing. whole different issue. Um, so parody. I usually tell you guys to do, ask. 
parody is using a work to make fun of the work. Um, and that is a very specific thing. And that's considered very socially beneficial because it's how we get a lot of social commentary sort of through humor. Um, on the other end, you have whole scale Xeroxing of Harry Potter book seven, uh, minus the epilogue. Uh, that is not sufficiently transformative to get you into a fair use um, space. So a lot of, you know, the problem is that this does not really comport with how people interact with media, especially online. Um, you know, fandoms are kind of an extreme example because there's a lot of transformative stuff. The people who run Archive of Our Own, which just got a Hugo this year, yay! Um, uh, they, the Organization for Transformative Works. Uh, they are pretty active in copyright policy stuff. They're wonderful folks. Um, and that's their whole MO is saying, is coming up and explaining to lawmakers, you know, look, this is, this is, a, there's this huge amount of by and large non-economic activity that is going on with, that interacts with copyright in a way that our traditional models about how we think, uh, and how we construct the law don't match up with, um, you know, the law was basically built on the back of this notion that it was a one direction of consumption. It was a product was birthed. It was released into the world. It was consumed. And then that was sort of the end of it, that there was no bounce back. There was no, um, you know, sort of end interaction among the consumers. It doesn't really account for that kind of transformative interaction with stuff. Um, so a lot of what we run into is, you know, it, music sampling is like a classic example. Um, hip hop, the law did not know what to do with hip hop. Um, for It still arguably doesn't. I mean, anyone who followed the Blurred Lines case in any detail, just what, a, what an absolute nightmare for everyone involved. Um, and it, this also starts running into problems when you have things like, we now allow copyright for software. And so if you are a super nerd and you follow the Google versus Oracle decade long lawsuit that is now on petition before the Supreme Court again, uh, which is not something that usually happens twice in a lawsuit, but here we are, that's now on a fair use question um, about whether or not copying someone's API or mimicking, re-implementing an API uh, is a fair use, which is probably the single nerdiest sentence I have to argue in my day job. Um, but I feel strongly about it too. We all and feel very strongly good. about it. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. That's bad that we have to have this discussion. Um, and we'll probably think for different reasons it's bad. Uh, but the short version is we have a copyright system that is fundamentally de derived from the notion of printer's guilds. If you go all the way back in history, it goes back to the Statute of Anne. It was literally granting one guild the ability exclusively to produce books. Um, and that was where copy, it was the right to make copies. Um, and that has expanded, but that fundamental notion of it's one direction, you have the person who makes the thing and then other people pay to read the thing, and then that's the end of the transaction, maybe to keep the thing, um, and that that's the end of their interaction. That is the model that copyright has been built off of, and it has been sort of duct taped onto that model. We just duct tape new and new rights. We almost never remove anything from the copyright statute. We're just constantly adding more and more stuff. Um, including things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and anti-circumvention provisions. And um, now you add what is arguably a whole other layer of law functionally, which is the content moderation policies of large websites, which as a functional matter end up dictating what is and is not fair use. Um, YouTube has a much larger say in what is fair use on, as a practical matter for most people than the actual courts do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, happy to talk about this at length. I could go absolutely for days and days and days. Be very wary if you try to be my friend, because I will. Um, so yeah, there's there's a ton of stuff going on. It, it's all nuts. That's my short version. Which is very informative, I know. Um, Dwayne or Donna, did you guys want to? Um, I was going to talk about trademarks and patents, but thank you very much. Mm. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I, thanks for that. No, the, the thing that I would, um, because what I see from copyright from a litigation standpoint is clients always want to know what the bright line is. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the few areas in intellectual property where there literally is no bright line. You know, it very much is a we know it when we see it, which I know is frustrating for clients and for everyone because you want to know, okay, I'm doing this, is that okay? Mm -hmm. And you really have to see how it's used, in what context, and actually see the physical manifestation of that in order to have any clue. And even then, it's, it's kind of guesswork, which again, I know is frustrating. Uh, I had a client, for example, years ago, they were in the electronics space, and they came to me and they said, okay, we want to do this with our signage, and it, let me show you our golden arches. <laughs> 
And I said, let me stop you right there. <laughs> um, burn everything that you have. Don't show it to anybody. Change your name and move. Yeah. Never, ever, ever. And they, But they tried to make the case that, oh, this is fair use. It's like, oh, this is funny because we're commenting on we're a new business and, you know, we don't have billions and billions served. Like, no. Absolutely not. So. Yeah, did, I was going to say, did you actually want to bring up, I think I always think of the Charbucks uh, case, which is, I don't remember if that was technically a copyright or a trademark that case. That trademark. Was that a yeah. trademark? Yeah. yeah the, um, there was a, I do not remember it, so, like, you know, feel free to jump in, but essentially someone, a, a coffee roaster made their own brand of deliberately burnt coffee beans that they called Charbucks, because mm -hmm. uh, they hated yeah. Starbucks and thought yeah. it was, the dark roast was burned constantly, and they got sued, perhaps surprising no one, uh, and they lost. Naturally. Yeah. But you know, I mean, it's all over the board, because you also had recently the uh, dog treat, dog toy, Chewy Vuitton, Chewy Vuitton you know, and they got sued. And, you know, it went all the way up and they eventually won. But what a Pyrrhic victory that you've spent, you know, way more a, than you've ever made on your dog yeah, treats. Yeah, a million and a half dollars to show that you are right and to establish that Louis Vuitton has absolutely no sense of humor whatsoever. I mean, that's... Which we knew. Yeah. Now, those yeah. are both trademark cases, so that's not actually this analysis. It's a slightly different analysis for trademark. Yeah. And it still comes down to don't mess with Coke, don't mess with McDonald's, don't mess mm -hmm. with the mouse. They will get you and they will kill you. Just don't go there. Um, they have no sense of humor. Whatever you think is cute, they will not think is cute. And boy, do they have more lawyers than and the four of us <laughs> know. Right. And this is why this is why people in fandom with backgrounds in lawyers lose sleep at night. It's because well, those of us who are in the Marvel fandom are inherently screwing with the mouse all the time. Yeah. Yep. Donna, did you want to? Oh, I, I, um, one of the things that, that occurred to me as you were talking was one of the issues that we run into, especially, you know, when we come to places like Dragon Con, you know, any, any Comic Con uh, fandom convention, I hear people talk about, you know, whether their cosplay or their, you know, fan art or their fan, you know, fiction is, um, Fair play, or fair use, and and they're always like, oh yeah, I googled it. I'm sure I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. You don't need to worry about me. I'm fine. Like, please stop googling. Please, <laughs> like, there is so much bad information on the internet about yes. what is copyright, what is fair use. I cannot tell you how many people I have interacted with who have gotten themselves into legal trouble because they believed what Google told them. It is. It's never a good idea. It's as as Dwayne said. It's always a case by case analysis. There is no that is the only bright line is that there is no bright line. So you know when you if you are the one dealing with this or if you have friends who are dealing with it, please don't give them advice on Facebook. Please don't tell them to Google things. I mean that's that's as an attorney, that is the thing that bothers me the most is when yes. people go to the internet for legal advice because there's so much bad advice out there. You just get further into trouble. And it's not just because these are kind of intricate issues to pull like I said I do this for a living and I probably can't tell you what the judge is going to rule right. I can tell you what he should rule but I can't tell you what he's going to rule but in some areas at least I do know answers um, it's not just that it's a complicated question a lot of the information that's out there on the internet is just flat wrong I mean not just doesn't apply in your case but is just completely wrong right Think about how good you get advice when you Google your strange health symptoms. <laughs> everything's Have cancer. You, everything's cancer. You're going to die tomorrow um, unless you buy the drugs that seem to be advertised magically on your screen. Yeah, legal advice is worse. Okay. So I think we wanted to keep it open for questions because, uh, unfortunately, the baseline of Fair Use 101 is... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's much hey, more interesting for us to, anyway. to get questions and <laughs> comments from you guys. There were hands. Yes. Now they're all shy. <laughs> it, you got to get the guy oh, with the oh, box. There's oh, rules somebody, in here. Somebody first back. We live in a society. And you have to be able to catch. If you drop it, you don't get to answer your question, ask your question. Uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering. Uh, oftentimes, when uh, if you violate someone's copyright or something, they'll send you a cease and desist. If you, let's say you're reckless and you do something uh, that gets the attention of the mouse or whoever else, and you stop after the cease and desist, are you usually okay? Uh, I, I'm just saying this because oftentimes people just put something out onto the internet where you can't really take it down, and uh, if you just do it and then you obey the cease and desist, are you okay then, or are you still in for more trouble? Well, it, it depends on the company. However, I'll tell you from experience, most of the time when my clients get cease and desist letters, if they comply and say, thank you very much, we won't do it again, 
Uh, that tends to be the end of it because nobody wants to put their lawyers' kids through college for them. Uh, so Litigators are the only ones who get rich in absolutely. lawsuits. If they really yes. wanted to sue you, they would have started off with a, with a complaint. And, like, and that just yeah. drag your right yeah, to court. The cease and desist is kind of the Please stop. shot across the bow saying, look, cut it out or I'm going to have to get me. And you, but please understand, and this is a place that I've seen lots of stupidity on the internet. There is no rule about what you have to, how many days you have before yep. the cease and desist takes effect, or how many times you're allowed to ignore it before you actually are going to be in trouble. Uh, my, my, some of my son's friends have learned that you ignore your mom the first five times she tells you to turn <laughs> off the um, video game. My son knows better than that. He knows what happens if he doesn't turn off whatever he's doing when I tell him to. He knows better than that. My rule about a cease and desist is different, apparently, than some wishy moms. So you just don't know. That, but there's no law that says a cease and desist has 30 days to nothing. It's just a polite, we haven't sued you yet. Would you like us to or not? Yeah. Kind of letter. And also, it's worth thinking about it. Right. It's not, if they send you a cease and desist and you ignore it, they might just not, that might be the end of it. There's nothing legally actionable except to the extent that it's like, now they can come into the court and say, well, we warned him. We warned him and they kept doing it. And so will they sue you? Depends yeah. on, do they have in-house counsel? You know, do they already have a lawyer on retainer? Are they really angry? You can't tell from the lawyer cause, or from the letter because we write them the same no matter how angry client is. Um, but chances are, if you don't listen, there will be a follow up. Also, it depends on your reaction to that cease and desist. If you decide to fire back a 10 page letter showing how smart you are, my client's a lot more likely to sue you. Yes. Just because you're going to offend them, and no matter, even if you said, I'll never do it again, they're going to read something in your letter that says, oh, he's going to do it again. He just wants us to think he's not going to do it again. And so you're a lot more likely to, to get a legal response if you respond in that fashion to a cease and desist. There is a trend uh, on certain certain spheres of Twitter uh, that when they get cease and desist notices, which some of which are totally frivolous, some of which are not, uh, the response is to publish it and then put the people who sent it on blast. I cannot recommend this as a legal strategy <laughs> unless you are a hundred percent sure that it is a frivolous notice, because um, it's going to have that. It's just going to piss them off. Yeah, don't otherwise. piss yeah. them off, because then yeah. they're angry and have a lawyer. Because a lawyer wrote it, so right. they are ready to at least pay us to write a letter, and that's you know several hundred bucks right there for that letter. They were willing to pay us to write the letter. And they're already that much in. If you piss them off, you know what's going to happen. And when you do piss them off, I have cards. So. <laughs> Guy up here was next. I don't know how that. This is really cool. <laughs> hey, this is the high tech panel. That proves it. Okay, so on the. Social media platforms, including like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, the amount of, I, I don't even know if it's parody or if it's satire that includes, you know, content from the, the big owners, Warner Brothers, The Mouse, is unruly. I mean, it's every day, and there's like hundreds of thousands of producers or content. I, I mean, how is it legal and how can they sell t shirts and money? Is it just because they haven't been sued yet? So this is actually a really interesting, there's a couple of things going on. One, a good portion of it, I couldn't say statistically how much, is fair use, um, especially if it is criticism or commentary. So um, Lindsay Ellis, her YouTube channel, she does mm -hmm. Disney, she does a lot of different stuff. She got nominated also for a Hugo this year, it was a good year. Um, and, uh, but she does, among other things, reviews and sort of narrative takedowns of Disney movies, and she uses clips from the movies, and that's criticism and commentary, and that's, that is held up as one of the illustrations in the statute, which is to tell judges, hey, these are the kinds of things we think are probably okay. Um, and so that is, you know, as we were saying earlier, there is no such thing as a bright line or a slam dunk, but that's about as close as you're gonna get to a slam dunk of fair use. Um, the rest of it is this really interesting uh, sort of benign neglect that exists in fandom. Um, we have hit a really interesting kind of tipping point where, uh, you know, 
any minute now, if if Disney or Fox or whoever decided they wanted to bring the banhammer down on some of this stuff, they could. They could put a lot of people out of business. Uh, you know, they're folks selling replica Captain America shields. They could be like, no, 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 and no. Um, and they could do it, yeah. you know. At the very least, they could they could sue, they could scare people out of business um, because who wants to go up against Disney corporate lawyers in, in court? Um, and so what we've kind of hit is this equilibrium stage where like legally your exposure is pretty high for doing a lot of fandom activity type stuff. Um, practically your exposure is lower. Um, and the difference between the legal and practical exposure is always a really interesting topic because it's something that shifts more or less constantly. Um, you know, Disney could send takedown notices to YouTube for Lindsay Ellis for using super short clips, even though it is it is absolutely a fair use. Um, there are lots of rights holders that do this. They just say, like, I don't, you know, sometimes it's, I don't like that because I don't like the criticism they're levying against my stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, that happens with al some alarming frequency. Sometimes it's just, I'm going to use a bot that just blankets everything that looks like it may match up to my work, and I just don't want it up here, and so I'm going to tell everyone to take it down. I'm not actually going to look to see if it's a fair use or not. Um, there has been some... The, the short version is, like, the boundaries on that are always a little bit in flux, um, but we're in, we're in a stage socially where there is so much awareness around fan activities um, and things like YouTube commentary and, you know, the entire existence of TikTok uh, where it would just, you have to balance it against the PR that they would get for, for trying to shut it all down. Um, or interesting case study, early, uh, the 501st, uh, Vader's Fist, the Stormtrooper cosplayers, um, have a really interesting sort of history uh, with, with Lucasfilm. Um, and Lucasfilm didn't really know what to make of them for a long time. And then kind of they settled into sort of a detente and then Lucasfilm got bought by Disney and then they kind of had to start the whole process over again because Disney's like, what the hell do we do with these people? Um, and so it is, the short version is it's like a soft norm at this point, but like legally, yeah, you're still pretty exposed practically under the terms of like, you know, they could take down Lindsay Ellis' stuff whenever they wanted to, just by filing a notice. Yeah, that can happen. Um, on the 501st, because they're kind of a very obvious version of it, and they certainly aren't subtle. Um, they actually, and I don't know what happened after they um, had to renegotiate with Disney, but they actually had a license from Lucas to do that. And there were specific things they were allowed to do and not do while they were wearing the uniforms and things like that. So they were... Um, they were allowed to do it, and I think the res first response was definitely said, what the hell? I don't, what, who are these guys? <laughs> what, huh? But most content owners are smart enough to know that if you really make the fans who love you the best angry, your next movie is not gonna sell as well. So you don't wanna make the fans angry, but you don't wanna let them either do scandalous stuff that's gonna hurt your name and hurt your image, and you don't want them to s sell stuff that you would rather be selling. So there's lines there that they care about the most, but the reality is unless you have permission like the 501st do, most of that technically is illegal. It violates copyright law or trademark or both in some cases. They just kind of let you. Now, if you want to wear your homemade Captain America outfit here, Disney's going to say, yeah, cool. If you want to, you know, rinse yourself out as Captain America and do kids' parties, or worse, adult, and I mean adult, <laughs> parties, they're going to have a different feeling about it. And so you're doing the exact same thing, but you're going to get a different result. And it's also important to note, like, it, we, we pick on Disney because they own everything. Um, <laughs> but also because, because they own everything, the different brands under their umbrella have very different standards. Um, for what they're okay with and what they're not. So uh, there's an entire sort of subgenre of Disney princess cosplayers, and it, it is, even as someone who studies fandom, it is the wildest shit. Um, <laughs> the, the, the hoops that people have to get go through, there is special fabric that is used to make the Disney princess costumes for the official characters at the Disney parks. It, you cannot buy this, but it makes its way onto the black market. And so there is a black market for officially licensed Disney fabric to make costumes. Disney keeps a real hard fist on that stuff. 
And then a lot of the things like Marvel, just kind of culturally from like where the fan bases have come up in these things, they, they kind of tolerate a different kind of interaction. So the, the super short version of this is all a gray area and it just sort of depends on how tolerant the rights holder happens to be. Notice we have not given you an answer to any of these questions. <laughs> I know. We it's know that. It's, it's not an oversight. Um, so I'm a dancer and, um, I guess I have like kind of a two part question. Um, the first part is like, I mean, I dance to music mostly solely. Um, but my choreography is original or it's, you know, improv. Um, and so I try to post that to either YouTube or Instagram where that's usually only like a minute or Facebook. Um, and then sometimes you'll get, you know, the notification that, this contains copyrighted material and it has a little explanation like Instagram has their, has their own policy of like this is what it means and for fair use and then Facebook has one and um, with Facebook you know sometimes it, it's like I think that like mine fits under the fair use and so I'll say accept it and like post anyways and like Instagram have gotten you know a little bit concerned sometimes and like didn't post it um, but I guess I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on you know choreography like original choreography with an art, another artist's music, and then also on that like policy that pops up, and what happens like you know if you're <laughs> saying, oh, I accept it, I'm going to post anyways. Like, what is I guess the consequences of that? Yes. Yeah, so a um, couple different things. Um, sidebar: choreography is copyrightable. Uh, it's a weird. It's a it's a kind of squishy area of copyright because like you have to have something fixed in a tangible medium of expression, which is... But recording is, it counts. Recording it counts. Um, choreography's a little weird, because choreography copyright normally applies to, like, whole ballets, and not just, like, one routine. So yeah. if you watched um, the lawsuits about Backpack Kid and flossing in Fortnite, um, part of it is that a floss is too short of a dance move to get choreography copyright. Um, <laughs> these are the things I have. I get paid to think about. Um, <laughs> She's cooler than I am. I... <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. Um, so, yeah, so the music thing is interesting because part of, part of this is a business decision on YouTube's part. Part of it is the law. The law part is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has a requirement that if you are a basically an online platform, and I'm very simplifying this, but if you're an online platform and you host user-generated content, you uh, and, and a rights holder sends you a notice that says, hey, my stuff is on your site without permission. Someone uploaded it. You as the platform then have to immediately take that down. Uh, and then if the person who posted it comes back and says, no, 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 it's not, it's fine. You then have to immediately put it back up. Uh, and then you have to tell them, you two go to court and sort this out. I don't want to be stuck in the middle anymore. So that's the way, that's the mandate of the law. It's kind of a choreography of its own. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, tech, it's a burden shifting, which is in fact legal choreography. Um, so this is, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, kind of arguably the best solution to a really crappy problem uh, about how do you how do you, who do you put the burden on to monitor what is online? Um, the second thing is YouTube's policy about this. YouTube's policy allows them occasionally to look at a notice and go, okay, that seems like bullshit. Um, and say like, eh, this is probably fair use. You know, part of it is them having to give you the hand wavy, I don't know, um, you know, bit that we just did uh, in slightly more intelligible speech. Um, so, the business decision aspect of this is that YouTube runs something called Content ID, and what they use Content ID for is basically if you're a rights holder, you can say like, hello, yes, I would like to partner with Content ID. I will upload a sample track of all of my stuff that I would like you to do an ongoing monitoring for. Um, I would like your bot to constantly be searching your website for anything that looks like it may be my stuff. And then I would like you to do, and then there's like a panoply of options, you know, it's like always take it down, notify me and then I'll decide to take it down. Uh, just, you know, monetize it. Um, start sending me all the ad revenue. So if you ever read about like people whose work, whose videos get demonetized, in some cases it's the ad click revenue stops going to the YouTuber and starts going to the person who claimed the rights to the music. Um, sometimes for as little as like a three second clip. Um, so a lot of the problems with YouTube and monetization are their implementation of content ID um, and the particular ways in which they use it both as a way to monetize and as a way to monitor. 
And there's a lot of debate right now in policy land about should we force them to uncouple those two functions? Should you have like one system to allow people to make money off of the use of copyrighted works? And should you have another one that people can use to take their stuff down? Um, uh, so yeah, it's a combination of like law and business stuff. Um, but as a practical matter, like you know, like we were talking about earlier, it, what YouTube considers fair use has kind of superseded what the law considers fair use for a lot of people. So, and a lot of it has to do with what their policies are. But the sh the legal side of that is your choreography is yours, so that's not a problem. But the song is someone else's, and if you're playing that song without permission, you're at either performing or copying or both, and they do have a right, should they decide to, to force you to take that down. Okay. Um, with some artists, I mean, if you're using Taylor Swift, yeah, you're not gonna get through to her. Small artists are usually happy if you ask them, can I use your work? A lot of them will say, yes, please, just make sure you identify the artist and the music. A lot of um, less music these days, but there still is some that's being released under Creative Commons license, and they encourage you to use it, and there'll be a very clear label on there as to, can you use it only non-commercially, or do you, have to do you have to give attribution to the creator? But there will be ways that you can use it. And something like that is going to keep you safer, is to either have permission from the music owner or use a Creative Commons piece that is meant to be shared. Or write your own music. That's usually a different skill set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but technically, you're using someone else's song. And I'm thinking yeah. that if, you're, you know, if your clip is super short, then you may come under a de easy for me to say, de minimis exception or something similar, but I'm betting your choreography is longer than a few seconds long. Yeah. So there's not much <laughs> point of, look, there's my two second dance. Um, so. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I can't floss, don't look at me. I have a two year old, I have barely been on the internet for three years. Um, <laughs> I have a 15 year old, I just try to stop internet use at all times. Um, but so the answer is, yeah, you can't do that. The question is, does the owner care? Okay. But as she's saying, a lot of on YouTube is automated now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, if you say to, if you go ahead and say post it anyways, and then they come after you and try and, you know, do legal action or whatever at that point, and that's not the cease and desist per se, but mm -hmm. at that point, could you be like, okay, fine, and like take it off and like, or would, they, or would you still have to go through with the legal action because they If you want to, to like fight it, you, you have to go through the legal dance. If you just well, want to leave it up you. until you're in trouble, yeah, so there's actually, you take it down. I think there's actually two things going on. It's because YouTube has bifurcated this process. So YouTube, they do this first thing when you are originally uploading it, and they'll scan it and be like, oh, this looks like it might be something in our content ID database. Um, and then you can just be like, yeah, whatever, and just throw it out there. Yeah. Um, the takedown notice is the part that the, the law actually requires. Right. It's like okay. if you say, yes, put it up there anyway, and then a crawler comes along and is like, hey, wait a minute, um, and then takes a takedown note, that's when you get the back and forth, the end of which okay, is, y'all yeah. right. need to take this to court and stop making it my problem, says YouTube. So I guess I'm asking on, my, on that end, like when mm -hmm. they decide to take it to court, and you're and at that point, so they're going to sue you, or they mm -hmm. want to sue you, and at that point you're like, okay, you know what? Like, and you like, settle. Throwing, in, throwing yeah. in the towel, like, when the, the, the time to give up if you want to avoid hiring lawyers is when they take it, when they do the takedown notice and you okay. just say, okay, yeah. And that's going to be the end of it for the most part. Okay. Well, it's good to know at least like the difference between like the fair use and then like the actual takedown notice. Mm -hmm. is, like, no, I mean, there have been stuff, there's been stuff that's out, taken down from YouTube that was adjudicated fair use. Like the, right. the most famous yeah. case on this is the dancing baby case, um, which is uh, Lens V. <laughs> disturbing. It was just disturbing. Yeah. It was, well, no, I'm not thinking the, the Ally McBeal dancing baby. The, um, it was a, it's Stephanie Lenz. It was a mom who took a video of her kid dancing to Let's Get Crazy by Prince and the Prince estate, which is notoriously litigious, um, took it down off of fair use. It was Lenz v. Universal. Um, and she was like, you can barely hear the song in the background. It's my two-year-old dancing in a diaper. What the hell's wrong with you? Um, and got, she got sued for it. And EFF, uh, d you know, represented her and they got a fair use ruling. And essentially what came out of that was in theory saying like, yeah, there's a part of the law that says if you send a take, if you're a rights holder and you send a takedown notice, you have to like be reasonably certain that what you're sending it for is not fair use. And you have to at least think about that possibility before you send the takedown notice. And this is the only case that has ever said, yeah, no, they actually meant it when they put that in the law. Um, <laughs> otherwise, that portion of the law is basically dead letter. Like, there's been, never been anyone who has managed to actually take 
a rights holder to task for sending frivolous takedown notices. Um, it's crazy, crazy easy to abuse. Hello. Hello. Um, so knowing that there is law and there's policy and things change over time, um, as people who love fandoms and want to cosplay or interact with them in, in many ways, um, and also knowing that that can sometimes support works in continuing because we like the creative works, how do you think that we as fans can like interact with copyright or fair use and both and like push it forward to a place where it either is less murky or still like supports the creative work, but still allows us to have a role in someone else's work. So there's kind of two answers to that. One is the law answer and one is the social norm answer. The social norm answer is much easier, which is just to keep, keep doing it. Um, you know, we're in a little bit of a golden age right now. We're like, you know, Friggin' um, Michael Sheen is like talking about how he shipped Azir Fell and Crowley, um, and he like read <laughs> fanfic to prepare for the role, uh, which is <laughs> thumbs up. Um, I mean, you your go, sweater man. is in good taste and is obviously a fan thing. I'm yeah. betting it's not licensed. Um, no. And the pattern was not sold, it was found free. Technically, right. it's a violation. Right. right. If the rights holder goes after that sweater, there, there's they're gonna look like ginormous jerk, jerks, and that's right. not what they want, but they could. What we can do as fans is, you know, wear the sweater, wear it to Dragon Con, wear it to work if you can get away with it. Don't wear it to a strip club. No. <laughs> you know, yeah. especially don't, if you're performing. Don't make a porno, <laughs> um, step zero. That, those kinds of things will they'll shut you down in a heartbeat. And if the fandom is happy fandom, they tend to be happy to let us keep doing it because they do realize eventually we're the ones who buy the stuff from them too. Right. But, I mean, let's be real, I'm a big Star Trek nerd, and if they hadn't let us do our own stuff, there were decades where they weren't doing anything. And if they had shut everything down, there would have been fewer people to go to even the odd number original series movies that stunk. But we all went. Um, because we were still fans and we would still buy the t-shirts and we would still be huge dorks even if no one else wanted to acknowledge us. Yeah, I mean, Amazon looked at The Expanse and was like, there's a fandom and they're like, you know, raising shit because their favorite show got canceled. Let's buy that up. Um, you know, so it is it is a very visible presence now and it's like, you know, you can tweet at your favorite actor with a piece of fan art. So I think on a social level, like, you know, making fan activity slightly more mainstream, I think has been like a real benefit in just keeping, keeping the band hammer at bay. Um, from a legal perspective, it would kind of fundamentally require rethinking how we deal with fair use. And fair use, the contours of it, as messy as they are, tend to happen in individual cases in courts. And you, you know, you tend not to get kind of sweeping judgments, especially right. ones that don't make, you know, that make any kind of coherent sense when taken out of context. They tend not to happen too often. So it would require a legislative fix. Um, you know, there are always groups that work on this. My, my employer, Public Knowledge, works on this. EFF works on this. The Center for Democracy and Technology is another group that works on this stuff. Um, you know, in, in my dream world, if I had to redesign copyright from the ground up, I'd nuke a lot of things from orbit. Um, one of them is how we write fair use, and it, I would make it so that fair use could be presumed in the absence of making money off of something. Um, uh, you know, is that going to happen before I die? Probably not. Um, but a girl can dream. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, I think engaging in the conversation, uh, when there are court cases, OTW, that runs Archive of Our Own, they periodically will put out um, amicus briefs, which an amicus brief is what you file when you're not actually party to a lawsuit, but you just, like, kind of kick down the door and you're like, hey, court, I have something interesting that you should be listening to. Um, OTW files a lot of those, and once in a while, they will put them up for open signatures and say, like, if you're a fan creator, you know, we're filing this on behalf of you know, 70,000 fan creators or whatever, and you can add your name to that list. Um, so, you know, keep chugging, do awesome stuff, um, do awesome stuff visibly if you're comfortable with it, um, you know, and if you want to follow the nerds who have to do this all day every day, like, you should do that. Thank you. And I, I want to make sure that it's clear, though, not making money on it makes it much safer, but that's not, key in the that doesn't, you know, make it okay. You are much less likely but to get should. in trouble. It should, but it does not. It is one of those four, and 
It doesn't, it usually, if it's non-commercial use, it never gets to court, frankly, because no one cares. Yeah. But not always. You can't guarantee that, and you can't guarantee that you're going to win, even if it's non-commercial. A lot it, of people think that if it's non-commercial, they're, well, I'm not selling it. Yeah, that's nice. You're still violating and copyright. And some, some commercial uses are still fair use. Yeah. I mean, classically, the songs, a lot of our big copyright cases are about music sampling, and they're, they're, you know, you're making money off of it, and that's still fine. Until it isn't. Lord lines. <laughs> Howdy. Um, I'm curious about small creators um, who are making original content, and it sounds like a lot of you know Disney and big creators have a lot of availability to police their copyrights. I'm curious uh, what availability is there is for small creators to police their copyrights, and whether big corporations steal or use their material with fair use or not. Probably one of the first things that you should do is um, it's not very expensive to file a copyright application to register your work. I think the filing fee is about 50 bucks for the work, and it's the, the copyright database isn't that user friendly, unlike the trademark database, but it is something that can be done online. There is one now. They're modernizing there it now. There didn't they're, used to be one. They're yeah. in the I process mean, of doing a big modernization effort in the copyright office, too, yeah. so in a few years it'll hopefully be. Yeah. But I mean, it exists right now, so you can do this. So that's, that's kind of the first step for the small creators, because if you have what's considered a timely registration, that entitles you to get statutory damages and attorney's fees against an infringer. And that's really the most valuable weapon that you have in your arsenal as a small creator to start with. In terms of whether the big companies steal from you, as a general rule, I mean, there's exceptions. Hollywood is dirty. We all know this. But as a general rule, the big content owners go out of their way to never see anything that anyone ever has done that isn't their own. They, um, if you try to send them a manuscript, they send it back unopened. If you try to send them anything, they will you know, do this until someone removes it from the office. And they go out of their way to not see anything because they're really tired of lawsuits of, Oh, no, wait, that was my thing. I wrote it and sent it to you. And, you know, someone who wrote a vaguely, you know, boy meets girl mm -hmm. novel that was stunk, and then they wrote, you know, West Side Story, and oh, that was mine. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah. And so they try to protect themselves, honestly, against the, you know, unsavory versions of a small creator. And so the chances of them stealing from you is honestly very slim, but the chances of them doing something that might look like yours you know, if it's a good idea, has some other writer had it? One thing to know about copyright, this is more from the, next, from the 101 panel, but just because you write a particular story doesn't mean that no one else can use the idea from your story. They can't express it the same way. They can't use your words or your pictures and your names and all the things that make it specifically yours, but the idea they can use freely. And if someone else even created the exact same thing but independently and never saw yours, it's not a copyright. Patent gives you protection against someone else doing the same thing without knowing about yours. If someone else invents the same thing that you did, as long as you invented it first and patented it first, it's yours, even though they didn't know about you. Copyright's not that way. If they independently created the same thing you did, never seeing yours, two identical works could, I, could in theory, have a valid copyright. Uh, I'm there, actually, there's I'm, sort of one one caveat to that. I know in fashion and visual art, this happens a lot. Um, small visual artists will find their stuff printed on Forever 21 t-shirts. Uh, oh, that's because Forever 21 is a whole bunch of pirates. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> We know um, they steal. Yeah, but you cannot copyright fashion. That's a whole separate panel. Um, anyway. Inexplicably, uh, you cannot copyright it, Oh, totally explicably. We'll find out that. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, class because they always want to talk about that. And I'm always like, oh, you can't. God. I don't know why, but you can't. You just can't. Um, Get over it, you can't. So, yeah, so I know that does happen with some regularity. I think the, the mechanism by which most artists have managed to avoid that is naming and shaming, uh, you know, which it seems to work enough. It's not great. Um, so what you identified is actually a really interesting, very real problem, mm -hmm. which is that it is super freaking expensive to bring a copyright lawsuit. So a lot of the copyright lawsuits you see come from record labels, they come from, you know, Disney, they come from studios suing other studios in a lot of cases. No one else can um, afford it. Because no one else can afford it. And, you know, it's, your fault. it's, it's truly an ungodly <laughs> amount of money. Um, there have been proposals on and off for a few years now to create essentially a small claims court for copyright, um, for small copyright creators. It's a really good idea. There have been a lot of problems with making it work 
practically, um, making it work without violating the Constitution and the separation of powers. Um, just by the ways in which people have chosen to try to structure it, there's been a lot of problems with the damages that are at stake. Um, you know, right now, copyright, if you violate copyright and I'm a rights holder, I, and I have registered my work and done a bunch of other stuff, I'm entitled to statutory damages of up to $150,000 per infringement, which is how you end up with the $8 million iPod, uh, which is a great TED talk if you've never watched it. He does copyright math, uh, which basically is like, here's how you're on the hook for $8 million for, you know, a, a iPod Nano worth of music. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, that is another debate that we will be having copyright law until the cows come home. Um, but the question is like, how do you set the damages then for a small claims court? Do you just let people get back the money that they would have made if they had gotten a license? Um, you know, photographers have to deal with this all the time. Their stuff is copied and pasted all over the internet. Um, you know, photographers have it rough. They're, they're, the market has pushed the value of their work literally to zero yeah. uh, in most cases. Um, but how do you do that while not creating something that is functionally going to be a copyright troll farm with a lot of really bad claims? So that's a debate that is ongoing. Um, if this is something that interests you, again, Public Knowledge and EFF have been working on it. We've sort of opposed the iterations of it that have come out recently um, for various reasons. Um, but it's, it's definitely a live topic, and it's something that people are increasingly aware of. You mentioned with written works um, the idea versus the actual expression of that idea. And I'm actually in software, so I'm curious about, I know it's a little bit of a weird gray area, uh, like the intent. Software should never have been part of copyright. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. I, I, we agree on something. I know. So I guess this is kind of where my <laughs> question is that it's like wrong. the intent versus the expression is very tightly coupled in, in software. So I'm curious if there's been case law or if there, you've got any ideas about that is, how you that separate is, that or, or what. Yeah. That is the heart of the Google Oracle lawsuit yeah, exactly. right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> technically, your code is a list of instructions. Instructions are not copyrightable. Except that they are if they're software. Um, but, and even, you know, both source and object code are subject to copyright for reasons we will never understand, actually. Fun fact, when you register a piece of software at the copyright office, you must print out the actual code and then send in 60 pages of it, minimum. In printer, just yeah. straight up print it out and send it in. But they, um, they really don't know how to deal with this. The, so it's saying how much of copyright covers that, how you express it is what's technically done. What you are doing technically is not protected. So the clever function is not going to be covered, whereas the elegant way that you expressed it is. They can't just copy your code, but they can make another code that does exactly the same thing is what the law is supposed to be. There's a recent case you might know, um, Dubé versus King on the copyright issue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a brand new case and it gets to this issue of idea versus expression. And the judge, it was actually very clever. Um, it was one of those cases where someone said, hey, I came up with this first and it was a successful movie that came out. And the judge said, well, you can imagine an example where you know, the main character lives with his aunt and uncle in a rural environment. That main character leaves home on a quest he has a metal companion that's a key to that quest. He's accompanied by a large, hairy friend. Mm -hmm. The main character is seeking help from a wise man. And the villain, in each case, dresses in all black and has distinctive headgear. So you have two films that all incorporate those ideas. Infringing? No. One's Wizard of Oz, the other's is Star Wars. <laughs> and it's a useful illustration. You can have all these ideas, but it doesn't mean that the expression of those ideas is the same. Right. And mm -hmm. the court, I think, clearly set out those examples to make it at least understandable that the general idea, everyone can use the general idea. It's specifically how it's used. And the same thing would be true for the software. You know, what's specifically in there? It's harder to say with software because sure. it's not creative like Star Wars is, you know. So it's a, since all of yeah. copyright was yeah. since all of copyright that. was meant to protect just pretty, I not the fumbling of a hundred coders. Um, when you well, if, it could be. Yeah. No, so this is yeah, no, I'm this actually, disagreeing and moving over now. <laughs> no, this, is, this gets at something really interesting, and I don't. I know we're we're running up on time, um, but this is so. This is the atomization problem in copyright. This is. Yeah. You know, anything when you, a novel is a bunch of words. You can't copyright a word. Um, you can trademark a word sometimes, but yep. you can't copyright it. Uh, a character, which is something I deal a lot with in fandoms, characters are 
archetypes that we have built stuff up on top of. Um, you can't copyright an archetype. You can't copyright the hero's journey. Um, you can't copyright, you know, we, we, as human beings, we tell each other stories using a common storytelling language that has passed down through generations. And that can be, you know, you look no further than the debate in sci-fi about how sci-fi has depicted women and minorities or hasn't depicted women and minorities over the last, you know, 60 years or whatever. Um, you know, it can be very limiting, but it's also the foundation on which we tell stories. Um, and so the question is how much of that can you protect? Uh, you get into fascinating situations where, uh, you know, the lawsuit um, about Sam Spade, the detective Sam Spade, where Dashiell Hammett had licensed out Sam Spade to one movie studio and then turned around and licensed out uh, Sam Spade to a different movie studio to make a different movie. Uh, and the two studios su sued each other over this. Um, you have some James Bond is currently in the public domain. Only very early James Bond is in the public domain. All of James Bond is not in the public domain. So if you want to do your own James Bond, you can do that. You just have to use only the version of James Bond that existed prior to 1923. So there's, you know, you can do Sherlock. You can't do the BBC Sherlock. You can't do the elementary Sherlock. But you yeah. can do a straight up Arthur Conan Doyle based Sherlock. So it's this like fascinating question of at what point does something become sufficiently elaborate that we're like, yeah, that's, that's creative enough, that's expressive enough, that taken as a whole, it's fine, but people can still poach from individual elements at yeah. some level. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's, that is the core existential crisis of copyright. That um, one's fun though, the idea versus expression. If it's coming to, uh, if you want just kind of the smell test for what you can in effect get away with, if you're try if you're, Making your own character make it detailed. If I can recognize, I mean, I recognize her sweater. I know what this is. This is not official. I can tell you it's not official licensed goods, but I recognize exactly what that's supposed to be. It's a really cool sweater, by the way. Um, that would be a violation because I know sh what character she's supposed to be. So if you're trying to say, oh, well, I changed the hair, so that makes it not. Uh, OC, do not steal. Tim, 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 Tim. Yeah. If I can, re if I recognize it, it's detailed enough. If it's just the good guy or the hero, those elements are in everything. In, in conclusion, copyright. <laughs> um, so th thanks for coming out. Uh, Don't forget to rate us on the app. Rate us. Rate us on the app. Rate us on the app. Well. They're not saying especially rate us I well. Rate us well. <laughs> if you didn't enjoy this, don't rate us. Yeah, then you can just go to the next panel. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I think all of my copyright panels, I'm just going to have to edit from now and just go. Oh, what? Copyright. <laughs> <laughs>